I owe an apology. I've been trying to keep up with everything and I'm failing. So <laughs> um, today is basically going to be open discussion. And if the RTN coordinator for MSL is available to speak in regards to the RTN, then... Hey, uh, Tommy, I, I tried to give you a call earlier today and sent you an email. Um, Kazi's not going to be able to make it today, um, as far as, as far as I know. So sorry for the for the late notice on that, but um, he will not be speaking today. No worries. Thank you for that heads up. Um, just FYI, I don't answer my office phone anymore. I check voicemails on Friday, so I'm to the point that I have to trim everything that I can. So totally, totally understand. Um, yeah. You got an email though too, <laughs> okay. but, but we, yeah, no, sorry for the late notice on that. That that's our bad. So no, it's all good. So, but I did get under 500 emails in my inbox to take care of today. So, um, so with that, today's pretty much going to be open discussion, um, in regards to planning and community development. Um, I don't have somebody to kind of oversee the conversation so does anybody have something that they're struggling with in regards to their planning and community development as far as the local government Well, I can't, uh, I can't speak to struggles. <clears throat> um, you know, we're kind of a unique situation here. Uh, I, I, this is Eric Spangenberg. I'm with Lewis and Clark County in the city of Helena. Uh, we we kind of have a unique um, setup here, if you will, in that our GIS office uh, and the enterprise system that we that we have and that we maintain uh, supports both city and county government. And so we have users, uh, desktop users within city community development, and we also have users within our county community development, uh, city planning and county planning. Uh, on the county side, of course, they deal with all things from, uh, you know, citizen initiated zoning to now our hotly contested county initiated zoning. <laughs> uh, you think you don't live in the valley, you know, that type of thing. Um, uh, uh, they deal with the, well, our public works folks deal with the establishments of the special districts, things like the RIDs, uh, fire rural improvement district, road rural improvement districts, you know, things like that. Um, uh, but that's handled on the public works side, county public works side. Uh, but city planning utilizes GIS for any of their exhibit, you know, they use it to, to create exhibits, uh, things like that. We've done a couple, um, well, we actually, we end up doing it for them, but we've built a couple zoning specific web apps for them uh, so that they have those to support their, their, their work. On the city side, uh, that's a unique scenario there in terms of that community development uh, oversees the, the, the city planner uh, the head city planner oversees not just city planning, but also the building division. And the building division is the is if you if you're going to do any remodeling of your home or if you're building a new home, you have to go through that. There's a permit process involved there, and um, <clears throat> and so and so they they utilize the GIS, but they utilize the GIS actually through. Uh, I guess it would be a third party application. Uh, they use it. Well, both city and county use. An application called uh, Track It, uh, and Track It is a GIS-centric uh, application that's used for permitting purposes. Uh, they use it for permitting, um, let's see, licensing, project management on the city. On the county side, they use it for projects uh, and permits. We have our addressing in there as well. Uh, I think they do a little bit of code enforcement with it, but I, I don't know entirely. But the, the track application is a GIS centric in that uh, we, uh, we maintain the, the geotypes that are consumed within it. Uh, permits are tied to addresses. They can be tied to parcels, you know, that type of thing. 
And so that's an update. That's a nightly update. The track it update routine runs at 2 a.m. for the city, 3 a.m. for the county or vice versa. It doesn't matter. It runs in the a.m. hours to update the track it back in database so that they have updated address points and things like that. So, uh, uh, and in all cases, we, our office maintains the central uh, enterprise geodatabase that all the planners in either city planning or county planning access those data via desktop tools. Uh, we're slowly moving each of those. We have a number of individuals in each of those groups that are in our ArcGIS Online organization. Uh, we actually have a new city planner. He moved here from South Carolina. He, he and I had a nice, uh, nice discussion. He's, uh, once he gets his feet under him and gets things figured out, he is, he is gung-ho to have community development uh, on the city side, do some, um, maybe look into the development of some story maps to better, uh, better share, share with the public why they do what they do, if you will, things like that. Uh, Side note on that, our public works office, County Public Works actually has a high school intern that will be starting. Uh, we're utilizing the Helena Public Schools summer job program, and we have a high school student that will be starting next week with County Public Works. That uh, sole purpose will be to gather information and develop a story map for County Public Works to better explain and showcase all the good work that you know, County Public Works does. Their road, road work, maintenance of bridges, maintenance of roads, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. So, um, and I think he's also going to do some side work with the Forestdale Cemetery that he want that gentleman wants all their infrastructure mapped. So, uh, but yeah, I don't have any um, painful stories. Uh, I know that all my all of our users are going to have a painful. Uh, I shouldn't say painful. I I, I say this in jest, Jan. Uh, but all of our our users are going to get an eye opening experience here shortly this summer when I send them an email that they need to. Uh, start looking at transitioning away from desktop to pro uh, because we intend to upgrade all of our uh, enterprise and GIS server services to 10.9 at some point in time. Uh, I'm see that bead of sweat just form on my forehead. That was me talking about upgrading. So, um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, our um, we have you know I can I can probably address things from either a county planning aspect or a city planning aspect. You know I. You know, the, the benefit of being in GIS is that, you know, I know a little bit about everyone's job, but I'm not an expert in any of it, so. And, and Eric, I will be holding your feet to the fire on that <laughs> the comment about the upgrade. So thank you for that. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> oh, and I should say, you know, and I also point out that we recently, uh, we also have, I've sent all out, you know, in, a, in concern to Jan's comment, well, she she noted about her emergency response work, but you know the UC is coming up, and we've invited all of our users within city county government to to register um, for the hybrid classes that they're offering this this year. So, well, and Eric, I'm glad that you brought that up too because I'm not sure that everybody, all of our user community, is aware of that digital content and that it's not tied to your passes. So it's only tied to whether or not you're under maintenance or if yeah. you have a program in place and it's unlimited registrations. The key is when your staff goes to register and I'll put the link in the uh, chat window, but when they go to register, they have to have your Esri customer number to do that. And then the other thing is, even if they can't attend when it's being streamed live, they will have access to the content on demand after the fact. So please uh, socialize that this is available because there's going to be close to 70 different events that will be digital. Good to know. Are there any counties not that don't have any zoning at all? I think that uh, Jenny mentioned to me that Park County may not have any zoning. We don't in Teton County. The Roosevelt has just cities that have zoning, but in the county, there's none. Madison as well does not have any zoning at this time. And I should point out that the zoning that 
that is that that was in place it, the the type i think they called it like type one zoning that was actually citizen initiative any zoning that existed prior to the the county planning department initiating the helena valley zoning uh it was all citizen initiated zoning uh it was all done you know typically it looked like it was it, it followed subdivision lines and things like that so it was you know group of people got together and decided you know what they wanted to see for their community, if you will, I guess. And so, but yeah, no, the county's right now going through that the the pain of of uh, uh, zoning in the valley right now, a, a, a county initiated zoning now. So nice. So, is anyone going to the map conference in Billings, which appears to be the Montana Association of Planners Conference. Any GIS folks going to that? Doesn't sound like anybody. So, um, sorry there. Uh, well, I guess uh, <laughs> the library will be going, <laughs> but <not> <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there. It's the same week as um, uh, Mako, also in Billings. So it should be pretty busy. Nice. Teach those commissioners about GIS while you're there, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> or the internet. <laughs> so does anybody have any really cool projects going on for their planning and community development? Anything they're excited about? The We're project? doing all of our regulation updates right now. Um, I got the hazard mitigation plan done earlier this year. We're doing subdivision regulation updates with like 13 other counties and Staley Engineering is doing those. And since we're all doing it together, it's going to cost us 1400 bucks to get that done, which is amazing. And then um, I'm updating our floodplain regs right now, but obviously the DNRC is a little bit busy with some flooding. Um, and that's just about done. And then we're also doing a growth policy update, and I applied for a CDBG grant. And if I can get that, that $26,000, $27,000 document will end up costing our county 625 bucks. We're starting to go through our growth policy too here in, in Missoula, in the city, um, which is going to be my first or second growth policy, um, which will be sweet. We're going to try to pare it down from like 500 pages to hopefully less than that. <laughs> Yeah, I think those document regulation updates are important and we're, our goal, because all of ours were outdated, everything is outdated, and so they all work off each other and they all continuously, they're just a liquid thing, so they all need to be updated and reflective, and then especially in the last two years, the growth that's happened in Teton County is unlike anything we've ever seen. It's not that big of a deal, but where it's happening at is interesting, and I think it's important that we document where we want all of that to go, where we don't want it to go, and that those documents are all up to date. Yeah, we're, it's hard because, you know, with the pandemic and everything like that, the census and ACS and also the employment shortage, all that data is only available to 2020, right? And we're seeing this massive boom of growth after 2020. And so it's hard to be like, okay, well, like, you know, it's just going to have to be a giant asterisk, right? Of just being like, yeah, we know that all of this has been going on, but this is the data, this is the most accurate data that we have. And um, hopefully we'll, you know, this will be the reset baseline year and then we can update things after that going on. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to like, yeah, not have the most recent data and be like, this is what our community looked like two years ago before all of this happened. <laughs> I think like quantifying some of that. So I'm looking at like new post office boxes opening and we have like seven zip code tabulation areas or something like that. So, I mean, there's a lot of like overlap in, in the edges of other counties to, to get that data. And then like for the cities and towns, they're building permits. And because we don't have zoning. So um, I'm looking at subdivisions and I'm, I mean, just trying to quantify all of this in the last two years, because that's what I'm concerned about. We have all the, like you're saying, census data, which really is, useless at this point because there's been so much growth since that census data was taken in 2019. So trying to find other creative ways to get a little more accurate picture of what's actually going on in the last two years has been challenging. Has anyone confronted the issue of basically 
getting a good analysis on post-2020 information. I know like our county has just blown out. I mean, we literally had real estate agents going around searching for property that they could sell because everything that was available sold. So just the only metrics that I've found so far is our addresses, our new addressing. Um, has anyone found anything better to help us? So I know the city is, and we haven't done a projection yet, I think for 2021 yet, but they use, you know, the most recent population data and then use that building permit. So the population plus uh, amount of average amount of people in households and then, you know, so-and-so buildings got built with so-and-so many units in them. We're just going to, you know, fill all the units possible. And that's going to be kind of, you know, our population that we come up with. But that's, yeah, it's kind of, that's what I've learned so far. <laughs> I think our schools, too, are a good resource. Um, we have a number of rural schools in the county that have seen, um, I mean, population growth happening in a rural school is a big deal. And so that's one of the things, one of the issues with, you know, I mean, we have a major subdivision going mm -hmm. in and we had to reach out to the school and let them know that we're putting 17 lots in, 17 three-bedroom homes is how many students we imagine it could impact the school with. Um, and we've seen some of our school populations increasing now when in the past years they had been all declining. And uh, I think that's a good metric to use also is the, the amount of little kids going into public school is something they can account on. It's a reflective of growth. So I also wanted to make the point that Esri, you know, we've got our data that we do uh, current and then five-year update. So I just put a, a link in the chat as, about that as well. So we have uh, statisticians and demographers and we do annual updates to that data. Jan, where do you guys get that from? Uh, we get it from a variety of sources, but when you go to our data site, it'll list, give all the attribution. So we buy a ton of data, and then we also take publicly available data, and then we do our projections on top of that, and then we deliver it back to our user community so that you can use it across our platform. And then our projections, there's also, a, if you look deep into the website, you'll find a methodology report. You'll also find um, references that it's deemed to be very high-quality data from third-party sources, not just from Esri. And Dave, I just sent you a chat message. I also put another thing in the chat window and it's totally off this discussion. Well, actually there's two things I put in the chat window. One is tied to this discussion and it's the State College, Borough of State College, which is the hometown for, I believe, Penn State. And they've done some really interesting work around planning, specifically using ArcGIS Urban and then also ArcGIS Hub. And they make urban available for their residents to be able to weigh in on what's happening in the city project wise. And then the other fun link that I put in there, because I think it's super exciting, is that our chief scientist, Don Wright, is going to travel to the deepest depths of the ocean with Victor, uh, what's Victor's last name, Viscovo who's a world-renowned explorer that has gone to the tallest peak, skied the North and South Pole, and now has uh, gone to the deepest trenches of the oceans. So yeah, so hopefully you guys will follow Dawn Wright too, because I just think she's fantastic if you ever have an opportunity to meet her and the fact that she's getting to do this is just incredible. I actually grew up in State College. <laughs> so it's interesting to hear you talk about that. Yeah, Emma, it's a fairly recent project. I think it just got finished, oh, maybe four or five months ago. But we, I appreciate the fact that it's a small city, right? Uh, but they have a lot going on in the city tied, of course, back to the university too, I believe. I actually had somebody call and request our data from State College. And we started talking and it turned out he was living right next door to a friend of mine and it was about four blocks down the street from awesome. one of my college rentals. Um, it was kind of fun because we got on uh, Street View on Google Earth and we we're going, oh yeah, that's me right there. Nice, so how many different layers are the different counties managing in regards to planning and development? 
So we've talked about subdivisions. We've talked about um, growth policies and some of the effects there. What have you guys learned? Um, and actually, if we can, Dave, uh, if he's able to, if he can show us how to access the Department of Commerce the census information on the Montana DOT or um, Montana site, um, then we can kind of see our local source of information that's provided by Montana State as well. And um, if Dave wants to go ahead and show that, we'll let yeah, him. Well, and I, yeah, and I'll, I'll uh, I don't know how to say it, but uh, qualify that some of this stuff is. It, all we all we have up there is the decennial census and the ACS data profiles, which are handy. And here I'll show you where those are. But the Esri stuff is super value. Is this the screen you're looking at here? I can see your my map ceic.mt.gov resources webpage. Yeah, so ceic.mt.gov. We have a resources tab and we have GIS data. And then we have a open GIS site. And this is like your typical open GIS site that all the agencies have. And inside of here, and again, we're somewhat limited, hopefully building up some of this over the next couple of years, but um, we do carry the most recent ACS. But as I think one of the guys was saying there that it's only updated to 2020, which is true. So if I go in here and I type 2020, um, we have county, state, uh, place, reservation, tract, and each of these DPs are DPO2, DPO3, DPO2, 4, and DPO5. And each one of them has different sets of characteristics about a community. But what I'm gonna say is all of this is available through Esri in the Living Atlas as well. So if I type in ACS 2020, um, they have a ton of stuff that's, I'm not sure exactly if this is all updated, but let's see. Let's look at poverty status. Well, again, I haven't really, I'm sorry, I haven't cl quite looked at this. No worries. I kind of threw Dave under the bus about three minutes ago. Uh, so just know that I'm the one who threw Dave on the spot here with very, very, very short notice. So, Well, and what I can do is if anybody wants to ask questions, I can look up stuff too. But like I'm trying to see something in here. So let's say education attainment. I, I'm not sure if this is of any interest to anybody. But Esri has a lot of this stuff at various, this is at state, county, and tract level. So a lot of this is available to you just through your ArcGIS Online um, map viewer. And, and they have really good kind of uh, pop-up set up to do this, to look at the different categories. Um, and I know that all this data too, I'm pretty sure is available in it's kind of more generalized form, which is what is over here in our um, open data page. So like say DPO3 tracks, um, you can download this as a GIS data set, shape files, geo database. I always recommend the geo database because it carries aliases and it's a little bit easier to use but um, you can download these data sets. This is the DPO3, which is the economic characteristics. So it has things like uh, let's see, I'm trying to figure out how to use this thing. I mean, there's a ton of information, employment status, you know, yada, yada, yada. It's just like really thick. And this is just tip, tip of the iceberg for data too. So again, it's only to 2020, like that one gentleman was mentioning for the ACS data. 
Um, there is new population estimates that just came out for 2021. And those are at the county and the place um, level. And if you ever, if anybody in this call ever has a question about how do I get whatever kind of data that you might be thinking of, just give me a call or send me an email because chances are I have it or can show you pretty quickly how to get it. But um, yeah, does that kind of fit the, what you were looking for there? Beautiful, thank you so much. Yeah, again, I, without like, I could go, you know, I could keep talking about it, but I don't really know what we're trying to figure out, so. I know for myself, I remembered a conversation in which the CE Department of Commerce, DOC, uh, had some of the census information and I have to start looking at redistricting and planning out how we're going to do some of those items. And yeah, another thing too, okay, now that we're talking about that, the Montana State Library has the blocks, which is what people tend to use for the redistricting um oh, that's good to know if i look up census 2020 hopefully this will find it census 2020 blocks for the state of montana this is a gis data layer and it has a bunch of variables in it that are all the main um, big variables but you can download this um i can't remember if it's a gdb or a shapefile but that's all the blocks for the state. And that's what you would be rolling up in the redistricting kind of game. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I've, I've mined the, I mined it straight out of off the Census Bureau's website there. The Census Bureau has a, re, has a dedicated redistricting page um, and they have a lot of that stuff there. Um, because yeah, we'll be, Redit will be doing some redistricting right after uh, after the state finishes their legislative boundaries. We'll have to redo our county commissioners and our election, our precincts. So I just thought Ken, Bob, well, just add a, go sorry, ahead. Bob. What was that, Ken? I was just going to add a quick um, comment on the census stuff. Um, remember with that. Remember with the American Community Survey um, versus the versus the redistricting and decennial census that that's a that is a survey and so you probably want to you know look at your margin of error as well with that because uh, it's a sampled database yeah um, which is in that same table so you can divide your results by that just to get some idea of normalizing it the other thing or one way that at least Montana centric that you can begin to look at the difference between 2020 and 2022. Uh, I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't do any of this economic stuff at the block level. That's usually a block group or bigger. Um, but one thing you can do is everybody's uh, at least in the process for both the empty votes and next gen 911 are identifying structure locations for rooftop locations. Um, and there's more to that in terms of the details of what a civic address and land life and stuff. But anyway, there, those are fairly. If you're if you've been inventorying those, you probably have some idea of the difference in um, numbers of structures, which you can help with your own internal modeling as well compared to this demographic data. Yeah, that's all I had to follow on to that thought. Yes, and I and for the those block level data has air infused into it. The population does, the housing units do not, or technically, or supposedly do not. So housing units are, should be invariant. And so those should be without air infused, but the population will have air infused. So those are a little tricky to kind of use at the block level, but they can certainly be rolled up. And that's why they're used for redistricting is to, to take like a bigger chunk of real estate and roll those blocks into um, at that level. And yeah, the ACS is a little sketchy and the margins of errors are really important to keep your eye on because uh, when you get down to smaller geographies like blocks and census tracts, a lot of our state is considered unreliable. So 
And again, if anybody ever has any questions about that, feel free to get in touch with me. On that note, too, I'm always happy to bring one of our subject matter experts from the Living Atlas, because also with the ACS data, Esri, we do have uh, reliability symbols for our projections, so you can get an idea of what the accuracy is of those estimates. And again, we've got people that do this day in and day out, so happy to, in a future meeting, if you'd like somebody from Esri to support the conversation, happy to make arrangements for that. Yeah, the Esri demographics team is really good at what they do. I think that would be a beautiful thing. So, in the, of, oh, go ahead. Go, Eric. Well, I was just going to say, speaking of it, of Esri demographics, um, if you're using Pro, you can use their infographics tool, uh, and that lets you compare selected features. So, if you want to compare population, you know, do some things. Now, it does consume credits, so you have to be aware of that when you when you do anything with that. But there's an infographics tool in pro that lets you do um, census style comparisons as well. So I've used it to do things like compare, here's the city of Helena, here's Lewis and Clark County, and then do the, you know, the housing and the cost of living and, you know, those types of things to show for economic development purposes, the, the, the attractiveness of, of the community, if you will, so. So that just reminded me of something else that I might, if I have, if you want me to show you something else real quick, this, this is a tool that used to be on the governor's office site. I'll do this real quick. It's business analysts and some of you, that's an Esri application that you can have access to, but we also have a, a link into that through this choosemontana.com site. There's this, and the set page called invest there's a site selector tool and this yeah. again used to be on the governor's site and it's hosted by the state library and now kind of semi hosted by us as well so we're kind of jointly doing this with the library but mostly this is built for looking up commercial real estate properties and residential real estate properties it taps into the mls data set but on this reports tab hmm. This is pretty interesting because the site analysis reports, these are the Esri business analyst um, yeah. geo enrichment reports. Yep. And so I can select here census 2020 PL profile, and you can do this by point, polygon or city. Maybe I'll just do a city. And you can also do drive times too, if you saw in that. Yeah. And, uh, up buildings. Buildings will have some big numbers. And you run the report and it's a PDF that gives you a pretty good demographic breakdown of that, well hmm. in this case, Billings. And you can do this at, you know, like by city, by county. You can put a point down and then it, if you do point, you can also do a drive time, like in miles. So anyways, I thought I'd show you guys that because this is a free tool that gives you a free little access into um, Esri demographics. Now we, we in the library are paying for it through our ELA credits, but um, it's free to the citizens of the state and you guys would be prime users of that. Well, that's well, good to know. That's, that's cool because we, the city of Helena purchased a, um, a uh, third party application that is exactly like this. And it doesn't sound like it's gonna pass muster for the next budget round. So I may be redirecting some of our um, economic redevelopment to this site selector tool. Was that, so I get to choose Montana and where do you go from there then? Invest? Well, what do you mean choose Montana? I went to the choose Montana site and then- Oh, oh, oh. yeah, okay, I was like, choose, what do invest? you Invest, okay, invest. Invest okay. and then site selector. It's also down Got at it. the bottom on down here. Oh, I see it, okay. It's a little hidden, but it's it's in there. Well, it's not gonna be hidden for, for long. <laughs> well, I know it used to be, it was on the governor's site for many years and- um, Yeah, I thought this was one of those custom things that they did, but it sounds like you're, yeah, you're using BA on the back, BAO on the back, back 
back end, huh? Yeah, but it is a custom app that was built by SITSD in the state okay. in conjunction with the library. And, um, but they access the geo enrichment tools, which so have- You guys managed to get the MLS to cooperate with you and share their data set, huh? Well, yeah, MLS is a different beast. That's, yeah, that's outside of Esri. That's something- Well, yeah, that's, that's the whole reason ours isn't getting anywhere because the Helena MLS refused to work with us. Yeah, I'm not sure how we got this, but again, this was at the governor's office. They just transferred it over to our office like weeks ago. Cool. Well, I'm glad that, you know, this just made my day right here. Cool. This is all I needed. This is this is all I need. This is an air conditioning in my house later on this week. <laughs> Well, and I also wanted to make the point that a lot of our uh, government agencies use that reporting to identify who the areas of need are when they're putting in for grant applications. And because the ESRI data is well respected, it really can further your grant application efforts. Hmm. Yeah, and that that those reports have those five-year projections that Jan was talking about earlier. Yeah, and the drive time uh, stuff. That's just so cool. Yeah. There's another URL. But I still want all of you to buy business analysts online from me. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> well, it's actually very cheap. It's like $100 and you get more than just those reports. Yeah. Yeah. We have it here in our office. Yeah, I've worked with it at Carroll. We had it briefly here at Helena. And then we, um, when we got the EA, we kind of let it drop. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> No, no worries. Everybody needs to know too that when you get Hub Premium, it comes with subscriptions as well. So it's an add-on to Hub Premium at no additional cost. Well, that's cool, Jan. Since we just bought Hub Premium. Yes. <laughs> we should talk. Yes, absolutely. And Gail, I'm really looking forward about, you know, community planning efforts, this discussion that we're having right now. I'm really looking forward to what the city's planning on doing with Arches Urban and your redevelopment efforts, rezoning efforts, and then all the activity happening in the city. So yes, I'm sure you'll have a lot more, a lot more discussion to come. Yeah, actually, uh, just to interject, so we actually have urban on our uh, budget plan beginning 2023. So right now we are without a planning director. We have an interim planning director um, and we have invited our interim planning director to join us at the Esri UC so that we can introduce her to urban so she doesn't get like you know, fire hose in the face when we start moving that direction, uh, but definitely planning on implementing it. And um, yeah, super excited about that. I did have a comment about the housing me metrics. People were talking earlier about how to get data. Um, earlier, actually, when I first started working here in November, um, we were asked to participate in a housing report uh, metrics. Um, yeah, uh, it was actually something that we had piggybacked off of another community. And I have a, a whole spreadsheet um, of different metrics that we were asked to bring to the table. And uh, we kept a um, what the metric was. We kept a spreadsheet of what the metric was and what the data source was. And if anybody is interested in seeing that, um, I can tell you that some of the data we were like, yeah, no, we're not really comfortable sharing this. Um, sorry, I turned my video off, I'll turn it back on. Um, we're not really comfortable sharing with it, but a lot of the data that we got, we actually did pull off of the census data that was offered on Esri um, with the caveat of knowing that, uh, you know, we, we didn't have the newest census data at the time, but still it was great data to bring to the table. Um, so some of the things we were asked for was cost of construction. Um, we were asked for airport data, um, housing sales and prices. Um, Big Sky MLS was actually asked to bring that to the table, but um, rental housing, housing demand, population and income, occupied housing units by tenure. We actually got that from the census data. So there was a, there was a bunch of data that we, we really had to struggle to figure out how to get it. Um, somebody, some of it, like pace of development, we actually got that 
from utility connections. So if anybody's looking for that kind of data, it was it was kind of interesting how we kind of had to tease a lot of that information out. Um, and then we use that on top of the census data. Yeah. So utility connections is yes. a company or a program? No, just you. No, just utility connections. So who who wanted to to sign up for water? Like okay. so a true utility. Data. Yep, yep, yeah. So that's all I got. And, and not to beat a dead horse, but uh, the last link I put in the chat is our learn lessons. You know, Esri puts a lot of resources into helping people understand the technology. And so there's a whole series of learn lessons that are free and available to everybody. So I put that related to data. So that's also in the chat. Thank you, Jan. So what else on community development? Because we've only got about 15 minutes left here. So does anybody have anything that they're dying to ask or no or they hear crickets i'll mention one other thing that i don't know where this project sits right now but um the department of commerce is actually working towards a community development um, tool planning tool that just kind of co coalesces a lot of this data into one place that's easily accessible. This is probably a year or two away, but you may be contacted or people are, I know the first phase of the project is to contact um, county people, planners and, and GIS people probably to find out what's what data needs would there would be for for doing community planning. So I think you may hear from us in the next year or two um, looking for feedback on which data sources are most important for planning and trying to get those available to you through a you know web like our website or some kind of website interface. Yeah, because just as we talk, it's like, where's this stuff? You know, it's it's all over the place. It's it's in Esri. It's in hidden in our commerce page. It's it's on our you know it's it's everywhere kind of thing. It's in DNRC. It's in DEQ. It's uh, all the agencies hold a lot of the data that comes into play, and then the counties have a lot of it. Yeah, the cross collaboration of data can be huge in, in not recreating the wheel. So in regards to the growth policies, what layers are you guys finding as most important? I am tracking conservation easements. Um, anything that restricts, since we don't have zoning, anything that restricts um, or prohibits certain types of development, there's egg covenants people put on parcels, um, things like that, that I think are important that the general public doesn't generally like, usually know about them, but they do affect land use. Um, we have our cities and towns all have, or well, two of them, Fairfield and Shoto, um, have their own growth policy documents that we have a joint city county planning board um, that just trying to keep everybody up to date on, on all these regulations and things that are coming down the pike, but to, um, just keep us all, we only meet when we need to. And so the last time we met was like the beginning of January and now it's the you know middle of the year. We need to meet again because we're working on several, I mean, there's some subdivisions that we need to review. There's a growth policy update, things like that. I think it's important that you make sure that those, especially these little rural counties meet frequently so that everybody remembers their role and why it's important to be part of these um, little little groups of people because it always ends up being, I know I'm sure Tom, you see this in Madison County, but it's always like the same five people doing everything in town or in, in the county. And so um, it, it puts more responsibility out there to stakeholders that um, maybe wouldn't otherwise care. Um, but if they feel like they have a little bit of involvement and their, their voice is heard, then they seem to show up and help out a little bit more. 
Nice. And thank you, Mark, for the link to the empty planner conferences, the map conference. So are there other layers that you guys are finding important for your growth policies that haven't or that haven't been mentioned? I was taking a look at other growth policies, and I, this may just be specific to some of the kind of bigger counties at, at, or bigger cities. Um, but I was taking a look at Nashville's growth policy, and, and they were trying to figure out a way of how to measure gentrification over time. Um, and so they were looking at the number of people living in poverty in all high poverty neighborhoods, the number of people living in poverty in chronic high poverty neighborhoods, and then the number of people living in poverty in newly poor neighborhoods, and then a decline in the number of people living in poverty in high poverty census tracts supports kind of their concern about this census tract is going through gentrification because it's historically been high poverty, but now it's not, you know, there's people moving in with more money and so that kind of was one of their like, okay, sweet, like this area is going through gentrification. Like, how do we, how do we kind of make it so that those people who are needing to move out of that area can now find another place to live that's not outside of the city and we can kind of provide that for them. Um, but I thought that was a really interesting thing that I found looking at other community profiles. I would be interested in learning more about that. Do you have a link? or yeah. any information you could provide? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we're I very can. interested in learning about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And especially when we have so many people coming into the city, purchasing land that outprices the community, uh, people that live here, we're really interested in understanding how other communities are dealing with it and looking at the problem. So yeah, mm. that, that would be super helpful. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, and we're just kind of in this like, brainstorming phase of just, you know, we have our old growth policy and our old community profile. And, you know, do we want to continue with that? Or do we want to, you know, find a new way to explore some of these issues? Or do we have new issues that we're facing that, you know, the community is, we'll get the community engagement on, but hopefully we can kind of look at some of these new metrics and, and figure out what we can do with the most recent data. I know I'd love to see that as well. Our county, basically, the locals are getting chased out by the people moving in because they can't afford to live here anymore. And mm -hmm. they can't even move locally. So they basically have to move, you know, across state or out of state, you know, so they can't yeah. stay close to family. And that's, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what you guys learn from that. Very interested. Yeah. Yeah, that's still, super yeah. common. Yeah, it's yeah. happening here too. It's like yeah, one, I think the average price of a home in in Bozeman now is like nine hundred thousand dollars, which is yeah, yeah, a little yeah. bit more. Than <laughs> yeah, once we sell our house here, it's via Dios and I'm off to some other state, so I'm, I can't afford to stick around if we ever sell here. Yeah. So. Yeah, the city of Shota was looking at too when they were preparing their growth policy. They did a like a survey, community survey, and they came up with like the biggest hurdles to growth, um, one of which being childcare. And so um, they brought, they have like a working group of people trying to develop places. Um, they're looking for people to run child cares. They're looking for help cutting the red tape and getting them going and getting licensing done. They're looking for facilities. I mean, there's all these hurdles to just opening um, childcare facilities, but nobody can afford to move to Shota because there's nowhere to live and there's nowhere to watch kids. So, I mean, we've had, you know, a number of low-income housing units that have either, we had a huge fire, like, last summer or the summer before, and it burned down this old hotel where a whole bunch of, like, low-income housing was at, and it displaced, like, 20 families. And that really highlighted the, the fact that now all these people are, like, living in campers, which is great until it's winter, which is also dangerous because they have space heaters. And, like, all these other things are, like, a trickle-down effect of the housing crisis the child care issue. I mean, there's all these things. And then they were trying to rank like what the biggest problem is. And they couldn't really decide if it's housing or child care or both, why we weren't growing. So I think tackling those ideas too, and just keeping an open dialogue about, you know, people who have ideas or people who would be interested in opening a facility or people who can help with the licensing, things like that, just that discussion is important and, and making sure that those comments are all heard. 
um, that even new people moving in or people that are locals that are moving out and why they're moving, why they're leaving. Kind of like an exit interview, you know, when you leave a job, but I'm just getting that feedback from everybody. Is there something we've been discussing here? That child, the child care issue was highlighted in Madison County during the COVID stuff and uh, was recognized as a big problem. So is anybody, has anybody seen any legislation or anything that guides what has to be in the growth policies? Is there Montana legislation? Yes. Yeah, it's all set by code. Is there a bring, yeah, It's Montana, Montana code annotated. Um, let me see if I can find it real quickly. Under land use, I believe it's chapter 76. Yeah. Although I did notice the other day that it was like, like a community can do this. Like the the legal wording is very like, okay, do we have to, does yeah. it, do we have to follow all the guidelines or? It's a, it's a, yeah, it is like a guideline. It doesn't strictly, it's not strictly enforceable unless you plan it out really well. If you put the wording in, right? Mm-hmm. Run around like my hair's on fire. I'm not gonna have any hair left. <laughs> so, does anybody have any other thoughts on growth policy or community development and planning? Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to find the Nashville community profile. I can send it as a PDF, but I can't find it online right now. Um, so I can send it to you, Tommy, if you want to send it out to, to a bunch of people. Okay. To get um, I put the in the chat a link to the MCA. It's actually chapter 76.1. I just found that 601 growth policy contents. So, um, are people using the MAGIP special interest group forum? Has anyone even looked at that? Okay, so that is available. Let me. So when you go to the Maggot page under members, there's the special interest groups. There's the local government SIG. There is the local government discussion forum. And there is information in there based on topic. So this is one of the places where Jan had sent out some information and asked for it to be disseminated. I had posted it in here. Were folks able to find it? And then did people get the emails regarding it through the Google groups? I did not get an email for that. But I think I just joined the the group again so yeah and i think it was just before we re-added you mm -hmm. so i'm assuming that the email i sent must not have gone out correctly so that gives me some good feedback and insight into making sure that works so i will probably if a couple of you are okay with it if anyone's not okay with it let me know but i will probably target a couple of people and say, please, you know, Mark or Danny, you know, please confirm that you received this. Tommy, where Just was that at again on the mega plate? It is. So when you go to Magip, you will have to log in. And then you'll be able to see the members drop down. And then under there, there's the special interest groups. 
And then below that, there's the local government SIG, local government SIG members, and the discussion forum. Yes, yes. Yep. Sorry, I walked you through it, but didn't finish sharing my screen. My apologies. Okay, Play's been, been a little interesting lately. Sorry, guys. So for the next meeting, we do have somebody who is willing to present um, in regards to planning and community development. Uh, I apologize that I didn't have all of my poop in a group, as the expression goes, for this meeting. Um, I will warn you guys, uh, I'm struggling a little bit more on keeping up with everything that's going on work-wise, life-wise. So um, I'm doing the best I can with the tools I have. So if you guys have feedback, let me know. You know, if you're really frustrated that I didn't get the agenda out today, you know, I need to hear those things. Um, so that way I know what affects you guys the most. So I may also be looking for someone to take over the LG SIG chair in the coming months, depending on how particular things go. Um, so if anybody's interested or wants to have more involvement, you know, let me know kind of what your thoughts are. So with that, let's go ahead and have some other open discussion, aka water cooler conversation. So if you guys want to chat about things that are important to you that are GIS related, that's the only caveat to the water cooler conversation is and it has to be somewhat close to GIS. So I'll I'll jump in real quick. So I've been quiet the entire time, guys, but um, I came in a little late. Uh, offset mapping in, with mobile apps. Um, this has been an issue for us. We're trying to get rid of an old ArcPad installation and workflow and replace it with something modern. Um, but this was kind of the, the lack of the ability to do offset mapping. So basically to point your mobile device at some feature that's, you know, let's say 50 feet away and capture a point. Um, in the new apps is a challenge. Does anybody have any workflows to this? And this was really highlighted with, with the floods. Um, you know, a lot of the, the flooding that we had, you don't want somebody walking right up to a, a high water mark when there's running water there so they can get an accurate GPS point. So an offset ability would be really nice. Is anybody using, I know EOS has some products around there. Does anybody have a same need or have any insight about how I want to proceed with something like that. A lot of the solutions are really kind of um, surveyor focused. Yeah, I was just going to say the last time I saw something along those lines was a, a demo with a field collector that had a laser rangefinder associated with it. And that's probably more of your surveying type thing. I mean, and this was actually back when I was still up in Great Falls. So that's, we're talking 25 years ago now that. You know, they just set up, they set their GPS equipment up at an intersection and with that laser range finder, they just shoot down, they'd pick, you know, they could bounce off of a street sign, bounce off of a yeah. light pole, bounce off and do that whole thing. So I don't, yeah, but now you're talking like being able to do it with say a phone. Right, from a car camera. with, with yeah. a cir circle of error, which is fine. You know, if people are like, oh, it needs to be a sub meter, like, no, it doesn't. Five yeah. meters is fine, you know, but so, so long as we don't have to walk up to something and place a, yeah. a valuable device on the edge of something yeah. dangerous. Well, hey, I, so, oh, ahead. sorry. So Warren, yeah. I was just going to ask you if you've seen ArcGIS Quick Capture. I've heard of it. I haven't used it. Yeah, so we have uh, agencies that are using quick capture from helicopters, right? So you can use it from a moving vehicle. Yeah, so I'm happy to share more information with you about that. Okay, does it does it do offsets? I don't think, that, I don't know to what degree, okay. uh, but you the data goes back to the office and then you do more analysis, you know, back mm -hmm. in the office. So I don't know how accurate it is, but I'll be happy to have a, bring in other people for more discussion. Okay, that would be great because the next time we have some sort of flooding or you know other other disaster of some sorts, uh, it'd be good to have that ability so we can spin people up and 
get a bunch of data in real fast. Yeah, because we see it done frequent used frequently for damage windshield assessments, yep. damage assessment. Yep. You know where you you're not getting out of a vehicle kind of a thing. Yeah. So yeah, I'll be happy to share more information with you. Cool. Thank you. And Jan, that was called Quick Capture. Quick Cap. Yep. And as far as I know, it's a free app for those of you who already have our licensing. Just another application. Has anyone seen any good mapping applications for the flooding in Montana? Do they downgrade it to a hundred year flood now or is it still a 500 year flood? Last I heard was 500. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I was yeah. looking at the I was looking at the American Whitewater to be like, okay, like can I go can I go rafting somewhere this weekend? And then I looked at the Yellowstone and it was like the Yellowstone is higher than the main fork of the flathead right now. Like that is unheard of. Like twice as high as they've ever recorded it. In 1918, <laughs> the CFS flow was like I don't even remember what it was. Like I don't it's like twice as high right now as they've ever recorded it. They're going to be remapping floodplains for quite some time. Yeah. Well, so it's like go to, you a, were, lake. <laughs> go to a lake. <laughs> you were working on like the FEMA floodplain, Danny. Like, can can they just like use this time shot, right? Like, where they just measure the stream bank and just be like, okay, this is the 500 year flood. Like, we don't need to. I think if they were smart, they'd be gathering lidar data right now. Well, it's at its worst, and they can yeah. say that's what they've just gathered. Um, mm -hmm. Because a lot of that, I mean, a lot of these rural counties like Teton County are firm matches in 1983, but some of the, I know the Yellowstone and like Custer County, some of them that have had recent flooding have a lot more updated data. Um, but now that they can compare this, like they can fly drones over it, you know, and gather all kinds of data. And then they'll have, it's going to drastically change the floodplain in all of Montana. I know that for sure. So that process is like a five-year update. So hopefully they can uh, get to it a little faster than five years. I, I feel like I've monopolized the conversation, but one important note, Warren, you brought up the notion that ArcPad is still in use and ArcPad has been deprecated or is on the verge of being deprecated, I think at the end of this month. And as part of the ArcPad deprecation, uh, everyone current under maintenance on ArcPad gets a free field worker user type for a year. And so if any of you have, have not received information on that program and you've got ArcPad, please send me a note and I'll send you the information about how you request your field worker because it can be either for ArcGIS online or enterprise. Yeah, in fact, I think they deprecated in December. Um, so we got like one last good field season out of ArcPad. Uh, and, and really I'm not, I'm not, I've never been wild about the app, but, uh, that capability of the offset, you know, being able to spot a building from the road, even in a crude sense is, uh, is pretty viable for us. So I do see a question here for the, does anyone have the Montana state MLS website link? Not sure what the MLS is specifically referring to. I know of Marls. I know of a few others. Uh, I, I'm wondering if that MLS, if that's the one they're referencing, is the the um, ML the multiple MLS stands for multiple listing services, and that's a real real estate thing. But if you're talking about the um, the one that we just that he demoed, that's just scroll up a little bit up. And you'll find it. It's that choosemontana.com slash invest. Beautiful. But the, the MLS, MLS is a multiple listing service, and that's a real estate thing. And that's actually uh, <clears throat> you have to somehow you they're doing it by an API in order to do that, to consume that for the state library. I'd love to see the MLS oh, got into it. a GIS. 
And they're probably paying a subscription for that, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, we were trying to get them, the company that we were working with, GIS Web Tech, Jan, um, says they a lot of their clients, the MLS agrees to partner with them because the MLS realizes it's it's listing their properties. I mean, it's it's another marketing area for their properties to be listed. And for whatever reason, the Helena MLS were reluctant to work with us and provide us the API to uh, to do that on that web tech with the GIS and, web tech application. It, it and, was it's still it's still a mystery to me why they were so reluctant. But, well, and did they offer to sell you a service? I didn't even offer to sell us a service. I mean, we started. I was actually um, visiting with the um, that other company you ref, you told me about to uh, buy a service from them, where they were going to do a lot more than what you get from MLS. But yeah, uh, with with the changing with the changing of of city managers here, and now that we're back under an interim city manager again. Uh, the, that interim city manager is focusing on on three things: employee retainment, uh, ARPA funding, and getting the budget under control. So any of those new things that I did with the past ma city manager are kind of getting put on a back burner. So sorry about the sick one, John. Been for there, sure. done that. <laughs> and and we might be paying for that. I I could find out. I'll. I'll ask around and see, because we just got that from the governor's office, and I'm not sure who's paying or if anybody was paying for that. Yeah. I'd be curious if you guys were paying to have that MLS. You know, to me, of course, this is just me thinking simply, you know, for the MLS to charge to for you to post their data and their data being posted in another site, I mean, to them, that's just free advertising, for heaven's yep. sakes, you know? I mean, those realtors are paying, there's a realtor company in town that's paying a huge chunk of money for a similar app. And, um, you know, when he could have been giving us a link to his MLS for free, but that's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I felt a little burned by them and I'm a little jaded about them. So if I list my property, I'm going to find a realtor in Bozeman. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, prior to Madison County selling out of real estate, the MLS listings coming through like Zillow, I was getting questions like every week and I just wanted to be able to tie the MLS number to a geocode and say, look, here, go to cadastral. There's the information. Yeah. Have a good day, you know, yeah. instead of fielding these questions and trying to figure out where this particular parcel is supposed to be. <laughs> I get like probably four calls a week or more from realtors. It's like, obnoxious that's why we have a website yeah. some of them i don't know if they even live in montana they're so out of touch with what's going on around here they're just calling with random questions how many people are how many departments are being affected by the staffing shortage and the inability to fill positions, i.e. Madison County, we haven't had a planning director in, uh, I think about a year. Um, we haven't wow. had a full planning department staff uh, in two years, maybe three years. Huh. Um, and that's just for the positions that are open. You know, I've asked the commissioners for four additional staff for my office this year and don't really expect it, but that's the need. So what are you guys experiencing? Ro Roosevelt County just contracts with a planner. Yeah, I think that's how the city of East Helena, I think does a lot of stuff where they contract with an engineering, you know, um, I don't know if it's great. Well, I don't actually, I better not say, I don't know who they are, but I think the, yeah, City of East Helena contracts with a planner to do any of those things where they need that type of service. So, I think a lot of the small counties doing it's incredibly expensive because yeah. they feel like attorneys. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not aware. You know, we we got our IT director finally hired. Um, I know that city planner 
uh, hit, it, that was a that took a while. I'm I haven't even begun to see anything about the refilling the city manager position here. Uh, I know we have an opening or we had an opening for a new uh, disaster and emergency service coordinator here, uh, a new DES coordinator. And I, from the last I visited with, uh, with someone who was on that hiring committee, it sounds like they found someone who uh, they had, they had a number of candidates and they found someone who's, who they're going to be making the offer to it. The last I visited, which was earlier this week, they were just checking references. So so we, I think we managed, we may have managed to get that position filled. Um, <clears throat> I know uh, just around town, you know, a lot of the service, service level things, uh, for example, the Helena YMCA closed their pool for the summer because they didn't, they couldn't, they couldn't um, compete with the uh, lifeguard, you know, finding lifeguards and they couldn't compete with the city's municipal pool in terms of pay and doing anything so they basically said we're just going to shut down the pool for the summer and when the city pool closes we'll hope that a lifeguard from there will be willing to come work for us for the winter type of thing so and to danny's point on the cost for the contractor we actually saved money by switching to a contractor well i'm sure i'm Our sure because yeah yeah, I'm sure because you're just paying a set rate versus having to pay salary benefits and all that other fun stuff on top. So, so one of the things we're running into is we've got our like subdivision fees are set by statute, and we've had an, a couple of subdivisions that um, went over the general usual review schedule for some reason, and so then we're getting billed like pretty high amounts um, for a really simple subdivision. And so we actually just. Um, I brought it up at the commissioner's meeting today, and we did, we opened a hearing for two weeks um, to look at increasing the fee table um, in those instances where it's an extraordinary subdivision um, circumstances that push that review out later, um, it, it require more review from the engineers. And so passing that cost on to the developer and the landowner instead of the county eating it, because we like, you know, we've only charged 450 bucks for an exemption and an ELS review, and the time the whole thing took because the subdivision was on the edge of the city of Shoto. So it actually, we were trying to figure out if it had to, if it triggered their annexation policy and all this other stuff. Um, all of that review pushed it out so that we got billed like $1,200. So this, so the county had to eat like 800 bucks on one little two lot minor subdivision that benefited one person. And so I, don't, I told the commissioners, I don't think it's fair to pass that cost on to the taxpayers. And if that becomes like a thing, then we need to deal with it because I don't have a budget for that. So that was something we had to bring up um, at our meeting today. I'm happy. I looked at like Mineral County, um, Custer, Carbon, Richland. They had all written language like that into their fee schedule and into their resolution that basically passed all of those extraordinary fees onto the developer or landowner. Yeah, and piggybacking on that, um, I am, Tommy, I don't know if you knew this, but I am currently a shop of one. I've been a shop of one for just shy of three months now. Um, hiring folks has been a real bear. Child care has been an issue for sure. Um, certainly the cost of housing, you know, it's both. On, so, <laughs> um, yeah, but, uh, I, you know, I think I found one, one person possibly in a couple of weeks. I'm not going to jinx it. Um, uh, but, um, we'll see about that. I actually just raised fees for addressing. It had been set, uh, for each address it had been set at 15 bucks. Back in 2000, just raised it up to 40. Um, and, but you know, that's it, just a, a bit of thought, a, a, an item for the group to consider. Um, starting to see what I would consider a pretty substantial slowdown in terms of the rate of addresses that we're issuing. Um, it was a, just a crushing rate over the last two years. It really dominated our ability to do anything. Um, and that's really come down. And we're also seeing a drop in some of the other fees. Don't know if that's totally sustained yet, but it's been happening for uh, at least a couple months, maybe coming up on three months that that's starting to kind of become a trend. Um, this would be a time of year when normally we'd expect to see more activity. So mm -hmm. uh, of course, many things are local, right? And Bozeman, Gallatin County being what they are, it could be we're in a somewhat unique position, but uh, just worth worth some feedback and consideration for the group. So unfortunately, you know, if that sustains, I raised fees right when the rate of addressing dropped 
dropped off. So, oh well. So we don't, both, we don't even charge for addresses. I should. Yeah, that's actually it's it's if you go around the state, um, some people do, some people don't, and I think park. You know, when I first looked, I think it was 25 and now they're up to 40. A lot of folks, it's either free or, or I think 25 bucks is usually a standard thing. So in Madison County, we're going to have to start doing it. Um, yep. The slowdown, basically, we sold out our property sold out. So that caused a little bit of a decline. And then there, the real estate agent started finding property to sell. And so it's been picking back up we're actually having a surplus of subdivisions coming through. Um, I think, mm. I think the planning department said like seven, whereas normally we have one at a time. And one of them is going to be a 60 unit subdivision on the edge of a town, um, a 60 lot subdivision. Then there's another 30 lot subdivision just north of town that if those go through and those lots become available, that's instantaneous. <laughs> going to be sold. Is that you Virginia know, City? That'll double the size of the town. Not Virginia City by Sherrod in Montana. Oh god. So yeah. Um 60 lots on three and a half acres, I think it was. Can the infrastructure so, support that? In my opinion, no. The yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll see if these things go through. You know, I think one of the more interesting things is, look, I've only been in this position a little over a year, but looking back to a lot of our old addressing data, you can see that there was a, a lot of addresses that were issued 2006, 2007 that were never built. 2007, mm -hmm. 2008, 2009, and even to this day were never built. So um, that was a pattern. Whether it repeats, who knows? But some I was in discussions with a number of developers. You know, a bunch of subdivisions rolling through, and I haven't heard a peep. Um, they could be still in the process, or maybe they're putting the brakes on some things. So, so Warren, do you guys issue addresses before buildings built? Then no, we don't. Uh, well, it, there's kind of a gray area where somebody says, "I need an address because I'm doing construction." Right. So you're like early phase of the construction, but how do you verify somebody's actually, you know, going to build? So sometimes we issue an address and the structure doesn't exist for, for a couple of years. And that's an increasingly common pattern just because so many projects are so delayed by lack of staffing and materials. If you find statistics on that, that's one of the issues that our last planning director, thank God they're gone, um, basically stopped any field validation or any validation efforts. So we're basically creating an address based on a piece of paper that somebody draws and it never goes away. Uh, even, and it never gets modified to a correct address, even if they change their plan, which yeah. when I was field validating, 40% of the addresses basically changed from the temporary address to the permanent because they changed their driveway location that significantly. Sure. Um, I have a hard time getting a handle on those numbers. I, I think I could actually generate them. Um, but, you know, the field validation, given the size of the county and the size of our staff, I, I'd really like to at least partly replace it with an aerial imagery program. I know DORs started talks about a statewide aerial imagery program, pretty high resolution. Um, Which I could, did get your phone call on that. Yep. Uh, Madison County. I can't even get the commissioners to get me the staffing that I need. Never sure. mind actually, you know, spending money on something that they don't understand the benefit of. Yeah. Well, I can I can come up with some numbers about like, hey, we could potentially replace our truck or something like that, um, and save some staff time in terms of you know tro trooping all the way down to West Yellowstone to go find a dozen addresses in the span of a day. Um, but anyway. Um, yeah, just in terms of rate of development, that was some feedback for folks. How are you planning on confronting the tree issue with that aerial imagery? Uh, leaf off, um, and it's it's not a panacea, but um, I think leaf off gets a lot of the way there because a lot of the development is in Big Sky in Gallatin Valley. Big Sky has less, you know, deciduous, but certainly Gallatin Valley is a lot that really does make a difference. They're also DORs looking at obliques. Um, which would really make a difference in terms of a structure, you know, accurately, not just locating it, but actually describing it and saying, yeah, this is, 
this is what this is, you know, it's a house or actually it's a apartment on top of a barn or something like that. Uh, but they were talking six inch and two inch resolution, which, you know, I should be able to pick out flex of paint that, that resolution. I heard the phrase barn dominium the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Madison and Gallatin County. What was the, what was the term? Barn dominium. Barn. Oh yeah. Barn dominium. Started restart, re retrofitting all those old barns into condos, huh? No, they were huh? old. They were new. They were like, it was like a new barn, little apartment up top. We're going to VRB out. Huh? Well. This is what happens huh? when you live near Glacier Park. Yeah. yeah I was curious, uh, kind of in a similar topic, the address. So there's the address and then there's the building permits. And then those building permits at some point get pumped up to the Census Bureau and then they update their housing unit numbers annually from that data, I think. And I feel like that's something that you all, maybe not you guys, but the planners that you work with, they do well, that, that, right? That's if you have building permits. That's if you have building permits, which are done at the state level. Yeah, I mean, we, I actually have an open, a several month old open conversation with somebody at the Census Bureau. We submit our building, the, the structures, the addresses that we've issued to a census portal every month, but it's really building permit focused. And it's, I've had discussion like, hey, we don't issue building permits. Should we be doing this for the census? And there's really no firm answer on that. So I don't know that land use permits are actually getting, or any any of those permits are actually getting sent to the census. Um, if you're talking specifically specifically about building permits is, is kind of an open question. I think that should be done at the state level, but I'm not positive on that. And I don't know where that, because only, because, you know, I think it's your incorporated communities are doing building permits, I'm sure, you know, like Missoula. Uh, I know Helena does building permits, you know, that type of thing. Uh, but, you know, once you get out in the county, the only permit that you deal with is, well, septic, you get, you can catch it with septic and maybe an approach permit or exactly. your, your two big things out there in the county building area. So hey, for us, the septic permit um, doesn't really, we get some information, but when I was actually doing field validation, every trip I'd find one to five houses that had not even submitted septic paperwork, not even, you know, PCSR pre-construction safety review process. They hadn't done anything. So there was no paperwork trail unless we caught them, so to speak. I told, uh, the, I told the commissioners they needed to hire a sewer cop to run this stuff <laughs> out. There you go. I think for us, uh, I think there's something, I don't know anything about the all of the DLI stuff, but they do have a portal where you can look up all the open and permitted stuff within your county um, in terms of electrical permits. Um, I'm trying to find their website here that I used. Mechanical permits, plumbing permits, elevator. Um, hey, that could be a thing for, for soaks, getting to their barn dominiums. Um, but I, I, I think these are, some of these might kind of be proxies for building permits. Um, but if you look up DLI, Department of Labor and Industry, and go to their permits, building permits page, um, it's not geo enabled, but there is like a big CSV that you can download that I think it has some sort of mix of addresses and lot numbers and maybe some lat longs and kind of random stuff. Um, if they were to GI, you know, geospatially enable that, that would be valuable data. Mm -hmm. Speaking of lot numbers, is anybody interested in working with me to try and push the state to actually have lot numbers as a separate field in the cadastral information? Darn. You're looking at that so you have it for um, attribute, I mean, for uh, as annotation? An yeah, for as an, well, not as, not somewhat as annotation, but more predominantly because there's a significant number of entities in Madison County that they only deal with lot numbers. So I thought that was I, broken out separately. It is and, in the legal description in there, the lot numbers blocks are in there. 
Yeah, but I've found that the CSV value of that, they're not always in the same spot. Um, thank you for sharing that, Warren. Mm. Uh, Warren just shared the link to the building code permits. But um, the lot numbers are not in a specified CSV format. They are in the legal description. And I basically strip it out by basically using a control F, you know, a fine tool. Um, but then I can't pull out parcel. So when I'm searching for a lot, I don't get parcel number three. Um, but I've ran into some issues and it's getting better. So I'm not so worried about it, but sometimes I've, you need to go back to the subdivision plat to see which black block and lot they're tied into. Yep. It's not fun. Yeah. And that's part of my pain of if I just had the lot number, <laughs> I could process things a little bit easier. So. Does anybody have any parting thoughts in the last couple of minutes here for water cooler conversation time? Tommy, I'd just like to say thank you for letting me participate. It's just, it gives me great insight into what's happening across the Montana landscape, which is hard to capture sometimes. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of being included. I'm very appreciative of you being here and helping us know about things that we don't know. You don't know what you don't know until you realize you don't know it. Um, you have some great insights and great information. And I know I personally am quite thankful to have you here as well as everyone else, because you know the amount that I learned from everyone in these meetings myself is just huge. Being kind of a lone wolf in Montana of trying to do things better, but I don't know what I don't know. So. And it's great to have folks like you, Jen, and, you know, all of you others. Thank you, Tommy. And also, I just want everyone to, I don't want you to feel like this is a sales pitch, right? You all have invested in our technology over decades, and it's really about getting more out of what you currently have in place. Do I want to sell you more software? Absolutely, but only when it's appropriate, right? <laughs> and I, I want to see you get use out of what you currently have. Nice. And that's, I'm actually looking at a quote right here next to me for more licensing. So uh, anyone else have anything? Nope, Jason's gone. So I got to go get some addressing done for him. Speaking of addressing, so. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll so. see you all July 21st at two o'clock. All right, thank you. Thanks Thank everybody. You Thanks everyone. Bye.